Well, how many of you are glad you got into service now? It's, it's amazing when, uh, you know, it's not guaranteed how it kind of adds some value to it, you know, whether you're in this building or in the upper room. And so um, you kind of have to contend for it and register and have a hassle of coming to church. But I think there's, there's it's something uh, beautiful about having to contend to come to church and not just take it for granted. So I'm so glad you're here again to our second location in the upper room across the street. And those of you watching at home, I just want to uh, confirm what Evangelist Brad said about cheer, Christmas Go Next week, come planning to give and support what we're going to do. Um, we're going to take up an offering and really focus on that. We have our GoFundMe page. We've had some churches, uh, Faith Alive Church has sent us a generous donation. I know Mile 2 is committed to doing that. There's some other churches as they do it. We'll let you know. Uh, a friend of mine, Ralph, actually just went to his uh, business and was talking to the managers or the bosses and just mentioned what it was, and they cut a check and said, here, we want to support it. So it, it, we found it's been really easy to go to anyone you know and, and when they during COVID and what's going on and say, hey, you know, we want, as a church, there's people wanting to get out and bless the inner city community and, and reach them, and so people want to support that. So uh, continue to like and share and go to the GoFundMe page, give to that, give every chance you can get. It's going to be an amazing time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, you guys are going to have to be getting better at responding uh, for this message than that, because it's going it's to require us to uh, be a little vocal uh, I said a few weeks ago, you're going to have to notify your voices because I can't see your faces, so I don't know if you like, yeah, yeah, I'm trying, I can't really see your eyes either, so you're going to have to let me know, know through your voice how I'm doing today. Um, I've been excited to minister this word. It's been stirring in my heart, and, and, and it feels a little bit different with only 30 people here, but I think it can still fit. I think we can push through and everyone watching. I think it's a strategic and important word for this time for people. And so I don't know about you, but... Uh, I've continued to feel the weight of this kind of season. Pastor Jim talked about it last week, coming in and seeing that fog and kind of saying, there's sort of this weight, and it is. It's continuous. It seems unrelenting. If you're a leader, especially in a church, I've had more conversations about this than I ever wanted to, you know, and on Wednesday afternoon when they announced it, I spent two days creating registration process, you know, and, and communicating and trying to adjust this and that, and it's just the weight of it, it becomes uh, overwhelming, it becomes heavy. Anyone felt a little heavy lately? Like just, ugh, <laughs> right? I've been feeling some heavy, they, they kind of refer to it as COVID fatigue a little bit. You know, nine months into it, getting a little fatigued of all this. Maybe you have COVID frustration. You're frustrated with how things have been handled, how things have been going. Maybe you have COVID concern. You're concerned that people aren't taking it serious enough, and so you're on that side of stuff. Or you're concerned with uh, friends and families and safety. Um, and, and when it first started, it, it, you know, you could watch it on TV and watch it happening in other places, and you saw some stuff, but it wasn't very personal. I remember saying early on, I don't even know anyone who's gotten it. Like... And so that was early on, but lately, I actually had a friend, a friend of mine text me and say, my aunt is in the hospital for COVID. She's just been put on life support. You know, pray for her. That's a little more personal. <laughs> okay, now it's getting close. And what really was hard for me is these latest restrictions of five people in a home. I'm just going to be honest. When it was 10, and maybe that's just because where I'm at, there was still some flexibility to manage the 10 in a home responsibly. But five for our family, we, my wife and I, we have three kids. That's literally the max. We are not supposed to or allowed to. I don't like saying allowed because we're choosing to follow it. Um, but we aren't supposed to have anyone. So my parents and kind of go, you know, my parents watch Dorori on days when my wife works. And so do we pass in the wind outside? Because <laughs> then it would be six if they're in there. So it became very personal. And I was like, well, if you have a family with one kid, you can invite someone over. You can have your parents over. If you have a family with three kids, you're done. If you have more, you have to kick them outside, right? But it's okay. It's been nice weather. And so our kids have just been spending a lot of times outside in their snowsuits while we invite people over. So that's how we've, no, I'm kidding. That is not how we've handled it. <laughs> just push them outside and then, you know, everyone passing. No, no, we haven't done that. It's, it's been okay. But it becomes heavy dealing with all of this, right? Just heavy. Ugh. And so it can start to get overwhelming. My daughter actually said, my oldest daughter, Aylin, when I was kind of presenting what could possibly be, she said to me, she goes, just as long as school doesn't get shut down like it did before. 
We're talking about a student missing school and not wanting to get it to be shut down. Now, I understand she's always liked school, but it was just the heavy even on my children is there. Like, they may not be able to articulate it, but they can feel the weight of it. And so, maybe you're a, a, a student. Do we have any other students here? Any other students watching? High school students, university students in the upper room. Yeah, I see some of them wa waving. Maybe you're the other way, and you're like, man, you, you were like me when I was younger. I, I wanted any excuse to have a missed day of school. Now, I never missed, like, four months straight, so I don't know what that was like. But I remember in the winter just hoping for a snow day. Do you remember that? Like... It's supposed to snow. Maybe this is the day that school will be shut down. You get up and no, it's not a snow day. Or, you know, when it was minus whatever it is, 50 without wind chill, they'd shut all the schools down. And you know, oh, it's going to be close. Maybe today's the day. It never happened. There was always school. So in the midst of school, I always had a favorite time of school. Do you know what your favorite if you're a student here? Marcy, what's your favorite time of school? Raina, what's your favorite time of school? Hey, thank you, she got it right. We didn't even rehearse that. She said, recess, or what I'm going to refer to in my message title today is break time. I remember when I got my new watch, and I could do that and count down about two or three minutes before every recess or break time, I'd start looking, and of course, you had to be working right till that, so you'd kind of be sneaky about it, but you would count down to break time. Break time. Recess. It was one of the most highlights of every school day because you get to go out and play. I remember during the winter, uh, they had a big parking lot there and they would shovel all the snow into this one big hill. And we, I don't, even, I don't even know how we got to do it. We play king of the hill. And the job was to stay on top of the hill and everyone else would try to push you off the top of the hill and become king. And let me tell you, I broke several pairs of glasses, at least one for sure, I may be exaggerating. I remember getting a scrape on my face. I don't know how long it was allowed, but obviously it impacted my life because I remember today loving it and thinking it was the greatest thing. And it was so violent. But that was break time. That was break time. And then their teams would be formed and, you know, yeah, anyways, it was, it was a lot of fun. So it, that was break time. But I think um, whether you're in elementary school, high school, university, uh, break time is super important. They actually added a few years ago in university here uh, an extra week-long break in November called Reading Week. No, maybe that's in February. Where's Jen? I don't know if she's in here. Is the November one Reading Week or which one's Reading Week? Do you know? Oh. They're both. One is like an extra one, and then they have like winter break. Maybe the November one's reading week. They added an extra week. You have Christmas break. So you have November break, Christmas break, uh, February break. In the States, they have spring break. Why did they do that? They added the extra one because they uh, understood that students were getting worn out. They have one in February because it's the lowest point uh, statistically post-Christmas. We have long, cold winters. It's dark days, and people just go through heavy seasons, and so they added breaks. And I think if, uh, uh, if we were to reflect, we would realize that our lives are actually full of these breaks. It's in our culture. It's an integral part of our culture. Even when I prepare for preaching, I'll go at it for a couple hours, and then I'll just step back, and I'll do some jumping jacks. I'll do a lap. I'll bug Charlene and come in and say something, and then go back at it, because it's like a reset or a refresh. I shouldn't say reset. That kind of gets some people triggered, hey? If you know, you know. Maybe not. You guys seem like not to care. But just a refresh. And so, it, but it's found in life. When you're at work, you have, or school or different things, you take a coffee break. How about this? You're in a relationship, and sometimes you hear somebody say, hey, we're just going to take a break in this relationship. Why? To see if this relationship should go forward or maybe stop. You step back, and you have a relationship break. Uh, maybe you got a cat nap in the middle of the day to get a break to refresh, right? Murray, you're across the street in the upper room. Little cat nap, Murray, take a break. Maybe you walk around and stretch while studying. How about a quiet time in your room away from the kids? I just need a break. Or maybe you give them a time out. What you're saying is you need a break from that attitude. I think I did that last night, this morning. Hey, just go up, calm down, and come back when you're ready. Take a break. Movie, a long break, binge watching something on Netflix. How about this? But all sports are set up on this. We don't realize it. Boxing, 
do a round of boxing, ding, ding, and they go sit down and the guy massages them and rubs that stuff on their face for their wounds and their cuts and stuff. They get a break in between each round. Every sport has it. Halftime at football, between the periods of hockey, quarters in basketball, and then halftime in basketball. What are they doing? They're taking a break to recover, recoup, and get their energy to keep going. How about day seven of creation? God rested. God took a break. So this is really important. I think sometimes in the middle of this heavy, we probably say something like I've said, man, if I could just catch a break. Anyone ever said that? If I could just catch a break. Oh man, some of these people, they get all the lucky breaks. You see someone and they win the lottery or something happens. You're like, oh, if I could just catch a break like that. If I could just... uh, to have that happen, man, it would be so exciting and so easy. But today, I think I'm going to show you something a little different. Because when you try to catch a break or just get one, it's sort of luck and chance. If I could just catch a break, if I could get a lucky break. But today, I believe I'm here to tell you and show you how you can learn to have a break. That you don't have to rely on luck. You don't have to rely on chance. But you can actually put into your life what you're already doing with many other things. You can put into your life and teach yourself how to have a break. Everyone say, have a break. Now everyone say, on the commercial that uses that, who remembers? Have a break, what's the thing that follows? I heard like a, what? Is that what it is? Well, if that's exactly what it is, I kind of got it wrong. But have a break, have a Kit Kat. (laughs) Everybody has their versions. This is how I remember it. Have a break, have a Kit Kat. And so today, I want you to remember the importance of having a break so much that I bought some of these. And Brad on Cross the Street has these as well. I'm sorry if you're at home today watching. I can't get it to you through the camera. But here's how this is going to work, because I want you to stay focused today. Bob's way in the back. He just got excited. Bob's praise just came on. The Holy Spirit got on him. The Kit Kat spirit. But here's how this is going to work. Every time I say, have a break, the first person to yell back, I don't care, because I'm probably going to say it by accident, to yell back, have a Kit Kat, I'll give you one of these. Okay? Not starting yet. Not starting yet. Once you have one, don't yell it again. Let someone else do it. Up to 12 Kit Kats, because when I planned this, I was thinking we'd all be in one place. But then I had to split them because now we have a secondary location doing the same thing. But if you're in the upper room, do it. If you're watching online, type in, you won't get a Kit Kat, but type in, have a Kit Kat if you hear it. It just helps me know you're engaged. I'm watching right now. And so this is going to help us. When I say have a break or watch this, I'm going to give you like a spoiler alert. Has anyone ever told you that in a movie? They told you the ending. You're like, oh, now I don't have to watch it. I'm going to tell you the main thing about what I'm going to be talking about. If I say have a break or have a praise break, Either one of those, if you yell, have a Kit Kat, you'll get one of these. Not yet, not yet. I had to limit it to 12 because when I was preaching it, I realized I said it a lot more than I planned. And so when it runs out, we run out and that's going to be it. So you're going to have to stay focused. So how about someone say right now, say it's break time. No, no, it's break time, isn't it? Some of you are getting close. No, that wasn't it. It's break time is something else. That wasn't the exact saying. But I'm glad you're ready for it. But someone type in, it's break time. The title of the message is, it's it's break time, what to do when the heavy is on you. What to do when the heavy is on you. So I'm going to give you the answer right here at the top. When the heavy's on you, you need to learn how to have a break. Oh no, I did not plan for this. Cool, because it's going to be like... (laughs) <laughs> okay, Cliff, come on and give this, give this Kit Kat. I think, oh my goodness, I think I'm going to need you to jump up and say it. Okay, because there's, yeah, you're good. There's no, there's no, sorry, there's no way I'll know by the noises with the masks. So you're actually, if you're in the upper room and you're listening, you're going to have to jump up and say it. So you're going to have to have some boldness to get a Kit Kat today, but that's all right. That's all right. It's pushing us to, to praise All right, and so here's the first statement I want to say, and I'm just going to jump into it. I've already taken too long setting this up. But the best way to have a break, all right, my daughter won there. Lauren is close. She's going to get one before the end here. All right, and I'm not going to say it again, but here's my point. The best way to is to fill fill it with crazy praise. Do we have that, Josiah? There we go. 
I'm going to say, we're just getting into it right now. And I know when I say praise, there's a lot of uh, reactions and different reactions. And, but I'm going to get into this. But the best way to is to fill it with crazy praise. So what I'm going to bring you today is just this. Three verses, three questions, three answers, and a 30-minute break. No. No, close, close. I love this. I love this. Lord, you are amped. You, I love it. I did not quite say it. Didn't I just said 30 minute break? Anyone here's break and they're just like Three verses, three questions, three answers in a 30-ish minute break. Everybody say it's break time. Everybody in the upper room say it's break time. Everybody sitting there type type it's break time. Here's the first verse. Psalm 150, 1 to 6 is in the Good News Translation. It says, praise the Lord. It says, praise the Lord. It says, praise God in his temple. Praise him in his strength in heaven. Praise him for the mighty things he has done. Praise his supreme strength in heaven. Praise him for the mighty... Oh, I'm, so, I'm just reading it over and over. It's praise him for his supreme greatness. Praise him with trumpets. Praise him with harps and lyres. Praise him with... Drums and dancing, praise him with harps and flutes. Harps get a shout out twice. Praise him with cymbals, praise him with loud cymbals. Praise the Lord, all living creatures. Praise the Lord. Come on, Leah, you said it's break time. Barbara, you said it's break time. Jen, you said it's break time. Come on, Alana, Dennis, there we go. Saying, have a Kit Kat. Thank you for engaging online. Praise the Lord. Here's question one. Does God really need my praise? Have you ever asked that? Does God really need my praise? The word praise means this, an expression of approval or admiration for someone or something. It's the expression, uh, expression of a- uh, approval or admiration for someone or something. I, I summed it up like this. Praise is an expression of our admiration. Praise is an expression of our admiration. So we can praise people, we can praise things, we can admire things, we can approve of people and things. We can praise sports teams. We can praise governments, not lately, but you could. Actors, heroes, how about your spouses, your family, your kids? You can show an expression of admiration towards them. And actually, if we were really analyzing it, we'd understand that praise is an absolutely integral part in every relationship in our life. And so praise by definition is not praise until it is expressed. So if I walk up to somebody, like if Alex is up here and I walk up to him, I just walk up like this, and he's, you know, safely distanced, and I stand like this. Would anyone be like, man, Derek's really praising him. He's real excited about him. But if I walked up to Alex and I was just like, Alex! My bro, you did such a great job on the announcements today. You delivered them in such a great way. Everyone was informed. You did it in a timely manner. They were so excited. I can't believe how well you do. Is that more praise? Come on, it's an expression of admiration. And Alex goes, oh, that makes me feel a little bit better. Right? Yeah, he's smiling under his mask. So praise could be words, actions. It could be a smile. Really difficult right now, so you got to get it to your eyes where they twinkle. Could be with a note that you wrote or a poem about a gift or a, a high five. Oh, wait, a chicken wing. Chicken wing. Could be a shout out. Alex, yo, bro, a text. Hey, you're doing great. I can't believe how good you are at this. Could be a song you write. I've written my wife a few songs. Could be a dance. Other cultures, they dance to express admiration. Could be a clap. I wish I had a headset mic today. I think that's big in our culture. And so we do these things. We understand praise is important, and we need to express it for it to be praise. But see, we don't often have a problem with praising people and performance, so why would we have a problem with praising God? I'm, I'm going to say that again. We often don't have a problem with praising people and performance, so why would there be a struggle with praising God? I asked the question, does God need our praise? 
Does God need our approval or admiration? Is God's ego so fragile that he needs us to praise him? And if we don't praise him, he's going to be off the throne and be insecure? Is he, do we have a narcissist God who, who needs to be told how amazing he is all the time? Like, is that why we're praising? Well, let me give you a couple examples, because I think it differs, praise difference, it differs in the natural versus God's expectation and why we would praise God. So, for instance, uh, sporting events had canceled for a while, and then they started a bunch of playoffs a few months ago, and they did them, most of them in these things called the bubble. If you watched them, what that meant was all of the sports were done in one or two locations, and they were all secluded in the bubble, and they had no fans in the places. And even now, there's very few fans. And what they were saying is that the home court, the home field, the home ice advantage no longer exists because there's no fans in there cheering for their team to praise them, to express admiration, uh, and, and get them jacked up or uh, 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 to pump up their tires, so to speak. So they're saying it's kind of leveled the playing field. And so when it comes to people in performance, we express our admira ad admiration to pump people up. So, woo, yeah, right? So we praise, we clap at games. Come on, I've been to some Ryder games. You ever been to a Ryder game? Uh, if you watch the Raptors playoff run, uh, I don't even know how long ago it was, a couple years ago, year and a half ago, right? Kawhi Leonard's last second shot on the seventh game as it bounced four times off the rim. When it went in, I was like, woo, you know, I was doing all of it. I was expressing admiration that that shot and that the Raptors had won. But when you're at a game, you do it because you believe it affects their success, their abilities, their ability to play. You cheer them on, and as the player said, when we get at the home field advantage and people cheer us on, it enables us to do better. So that's why you praise in the natural. But I, this is what I've noticed. I've been to some rider games where the riders have not done very well. <laughs> yes. Can I get an amen? Recently, it's been a lot better, but there was some dark days about 10 years ago. Like, I remember going to games, paying money to get there, and thinking, this is just, you can't even call this professional football. But there was one instance I remember, it was about uh, playing, I think they were playing Calgary, and they were on defense, and they had sacked the quarterback, and it was like second and 24, if you know football. 10 yards is usually what you have to get. Second and 24, and we're all cheering, because it was a pivotal moment in the game, and we're like, they're going to stop him, and they have to get a first down, and we're cheering, and everyone's yelling, and the quarterback and the other team goes and makes a pass and throws it down the field about 30 yards, and the receiver catches it, and we all get quiet, and they get a first down. And I sit there and I go, I said, why do we even cheer? And everyone started laughing. Because it was like, it didn't matter. And I don't know about you, but when, when your sports team loses, there's not a lot of praise that comes out of the other end of that. Woo, I'm so glad they got crushed today. Whoo, ah, that, you know. So praise in the natural is in hopes that it helps people for, uh, do better, achieve better, but it's also in response to the victory being won. When they win, you praise. Now let me talk about praise with God. And then we're going to really get into it with the little time I have left. See, when we come to praise, oh, I, I need to say, yeah, when it comes to praise, praise does not affect uh, God's ability, success, and confidence. Like it does when we praise in the natural. See, when it comes to praise, we express our admira admiration to pump him up for us. For our sake. See, we praise, we clap. We shout, hallelujah! We dance, we move, we tap, we spin, we get excited because guess what? Uh, believe it or not, it affects our abilities, our success, our confidence because of the one who we are praising. Come on, somebody. Those in the upper room, let me hear you say amen. Those in here, let me hear you say amen. Amen. So when we praise in God's kingdom, we praise not just because we have the victory or after the victory, we praise for the victory. So when we praise, we're not praising, we're lifting God up for us because it does something inside of us, but we don't praise after we see the victory, we praise for the victory as Pastor Jim talked about last week. 
So in the middle of the heavy, in the middle of the weight, in the middle of your circumstance, in the middle of going through surgery for a heart attack, in the middle of my wife getting her gallbladder taken out suddenly, in the middle of the storm, we know we can learn how to, sometimes we just need to sit there and go, guess what? I need to just take me a minute. I need to just pull myself aside. I need to just have, have, have a little rest and I need to have a break. <laughs> Judith and Daryl, you can fight for this one because you guys were simultaneous. Oh man, I need to get moving. Help me. So answer number one, does God need our praise? I put this, what you praise gets a prominent place. And I'm going to speak into this in the next point a little bit, but what you praise gets a prominent place. So when circumstances try to dictate, when, when they try to close your praise, when they try to keep you down, when it seems too heavy, when it seems too much, when circumstances try to dictate, then it's time to take a praise break. Not quite. <laughs> no, no, it has to be... But, but I'll give it, it, it needs to be, have a praise break, Lorna. Say it now. There we go. She's done so well. I've got like eight left. Here we go. So it needs to be the exact three or four words. But listen, when circumstances try to dictate, don't stand up for this, it's time to take a praise break. No, no, that's cute. No, not, not take, but. Someone say it's break time. Come on, let me hear you say it's break time. Verse 2. Psalm 22, verse 3 in the New King James Version says, Thou, O, thou art holy, O thou, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Question two, is my praise really that important? So the first one is, does God need it? No, no, we need it but also that whatever we praise gets a prominent place. And I'm going to show you in this point how possibly our praise can get off. I'll show you what I mean. But is my praise really that important? It says, O thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. Inhabit means to dwell, remain, sit, abide, and live in. You're just living in that. I love that picture. So David's saying in Psalms, you are holy, you dwell, you remain, you sit, you abide, you live in the praises of your people. You live in my praises. You sit in them. You rest in them. You're just in the middle of my praise. See, unfortunately, though, we read our situations into this. And we go, oh, David's talking about the two songs we do at church before we get started and amp everybody up. That's praise. But David didn't go to church. So he's not writing this out of a context of Sunday morning coming and this is what we do and it leads to this and then we worship and things like that. David's not doing this out of this. David is saying, hey, in in the circumstances I've been in through, and he went through a lot. He goes, I have taught myself and I have learned how to pull away when it seems heavy, when it seems weighty, when all the people, all his friends say, we want to stone you, we want to kill you, we don't understand what's going on. He says, I, I learned how to do this. I learned how to pull myself aside, take a moment, and I learned how to have a praise break. There we go. There we go. Oh, you guys are getting tired of it already, or you just don't want to be wrong. I almost took you out. Sorry. And David said, I, 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 it's break time. I need to be able to pull away and just do this. Because he started to understand that God inhabits the times when he pulls himself apart and starts to praise. This is so key. And I know praise actually, I've noticed this in the church even. It's, it's, been, it's been a struggle. There's been a push against praise. 
It's hard to find good praise songs these days. They're all mid-tempo in worship. Not that there's anything wrong, but there's something that I actually think an attack against praise because it's like, it's like if we can just stay comfortable in ourselves and we just do this, but there's something that gets unlocked when we are saying, I'm willing, like David did, to get beside myself and to strip off all of my earthly robes and my kingly things and my position and my pride and just come and take it off and say, I'm throwing it at the ground and I'm just gonna dance. And then when his wife came up and said, hey, that's undignified. That looks dumb. He said, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. See, where there's praise, God inhabits the place. See, I don't want just God inhabiting my Sunday mornings. Whoo! I'm getting myself excited this morning. I don't want God just inhabiting my Sunday mornings. See, I want God to inhabit every part of my life. I want God living in my work, my school, my business, my home, my shopping, my coming, my going, my storm, my broken relationships, my fear, my worry, my doubt. I want God in the middle of COVID, in the heavy areas of my life, with his presence, with his power, with his uh, uh, wholeness being beside me, dwelling with me, and just living with me. Oh. <sighs> Praise is an invitation for inhabitation. So we talked about it being in, in, integral in every relationship. Let me give you an example with my wife and I. If I praise her, honey, you're doing such a great job recovering from your surgery and going to work and handling all that. And I really realized how much I value because when I had to do that, be by myself for two weeks trying to handle it, it was pretty much impossible. And so thank you for doing that, and you do such an amazing job. And, or I come up to her, and she's wearing something like, man, you look fine today. Those pants? Yeah. Right? It's an expression of admiration for who she is, how she looks, what she's doing. And so when I praise my wife, it's an invitation for inhabitation, if you know what I mean. No, not just that, come on, I know. But you know it is. It's intimacy. It's getting together. Rather than if I don't praise, and I need to point this out, this is important. Not praising is just not saying anything, like I did with Alex. Right? Or any husbands heard the story. Of course I love my wife. I told her when I married her, didn't I? Or how about this? If... My praise becomes something towards the negative, where what I say uh, becomes so much that it almost becomes an admiration for what is happening. Watch, watch, watch. Could we not, through our words, because we know words are containers, do we not ever get to the point that when we are going through something, or when we are tired of something, we talk about it so much even if it's in protest, which I'll get to, even if it's about how we don't like it, we actually almost put it as a praise position in our life. And it becomes, it starts to have a prominent place, even if we're saying, I'm against this. Oh, I just don't like this. I don't like what's going on. But because we're saying it so much, it's almost like we are expressing admiration for it. And it starts to have a prominent place. And watch this, watch this. This is where it gets good. Instead of our praise being something that God inhabits, our praise ends up being something that almost ends up inhibiting God. Watch, 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 watch. See, our praise should be inhabiting, not inhibiting. Inhibiting means to hinder, restrain, or prevent. See, I ask this question of myself. Would my praise change? This is important. Would my praise change if Jesus walked into this place? Would we put our coffees down? Would we still say, oh, just not like that? And some aren't wired this way. Apparently, if you know me, I am, I guess. But if Jesus walked in, in all of his glory, and all of his splendor, and all his nail-scarred hands, what our praise need to change? Because it says he inhabits our praises. 
And so we're going through heavy. It's a heavy time. It's a tough time. There's circumstances. There's things people have gone through that I can't even imagine. I haven't even lived through. And, and maybe you're a Christian or maybe you're looking at the evil in the world and what's going on and you go, God, are you there? What's happening? But see, I think we all need and want this. We need a God who inhabits, but sometimes I believe we have a praise that inhibits. We got a weight that's crushing, but we need a praise full of expression. And so, with our words, we got to be careful that our words are not creating different uh, inhabitation places. Because point number two, what I praise inhabits my place. And I said that specifically, what I praise or who I praise inhabits my place. So if you need some hope and encouragement today, then you need to maybe get your praise on. You need to, you maybe need to get your praise on. You may need to have a praise break. All right, you're first, Alex. Alex. Oh, that just, that broke. What I praise inhabits my place. And by inhabiting something, you often inhibit something else. And so that's what I said. I believe sometimes our praise inha- inhibits God, and sometimes it inhabits circumstances. So our praise should be used to inhibit circumstances and inhabit God. I'm using the word inhabit God kind of loosely, or to mean God inhabits our praises, to cause a habitation for God to move. So for instance, if we praise doubt, it inhibits our faith. See, we think praise is just, but if we talk about doubt all the time, and oh, I'm not sure about this, and I don't know what's going to happen with this, we end up inadvertently inhibiting our faith without realizing it, and causing a habitation for doubt to come in. We praise worry, and it inhibits our peace. We praise fear, and it inhibits our love. We praise hope on the flip side, and it inhibits our hopelessness. We praise strength, and it inhibits our weaknesses. We praise God, and it inhibits our enemies. See, you may be facing some big obstacles. You may be feeling the weight and the heavy of this season. You may be short on strength, short on perspective, short on energy, but I'm here to say it's time to have a praise break. Okay. Oh, you two were so close. I got lots. I'm going to throw both out for you guys. Come on up. I'll just put them on the ground. I don't want to hurt anyone. So what I mean by we need, don't jump here, we need a praise break. What I mean by that is I mean we need to take a break, watch, 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 from praising what we are facing and take a moment to start praising who we're chasing. Come on. We need to take a break from stop praising inadvertently sometimes what we are facing. And we need to turn and say, we just need to have me a minute. I just need to uh, uh, just say it's break time. And we need to turn from praising what we're facing and start praising who we're chasing. Because God inhabits the praises of his people. And whatever we're chasing and praising gets prominent place. Verse 3, here we go, last one, and then I'm done. Acts 16, 25 in the Good News Translation. Ooh, it's going to get gooder. I need a drink before this. Got to get amped up. How you doing in the upper room? Let me see, what are people saying? God inhabits the places of people. Second Timothy, God's not giving us a spirit of fear. Praise is an invitation for habitation. Love that. Dance like David danced. Come on. Come on. Keep your comments coming. Acts 16, 25 in the Good News Translation. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Question three, what happens when I praise? Or what happens when I praise who I am chasing? Because I want to mean proper praise, praising the right things, the right person, praising God who we're chasing. 
So let me give you a context here of this verse because we're jumping right in. Paul and Silas in this context when they started praying and singing and praising were not in a comfy church chair. A nice new brown chair is not our old plastic ones and the other ones that weren't as comfy. A nice comfy chair. They were not in a comfy chair with soft brown seats, with some great heat, a projector with words, a small band leading and coffee in their hands. And so if you know this story, which many of you do, so I'll go fast, but you can read it on your own if you're not sure. They'd been preaching the gospel and a lady had come up behind them and started saying, you know, these are Paul and Silas, they're men of God and all that. And they, Paul discovered she was being influenced by an evil spirit. She was a fortune teller, telling people's fortunes and futures and making some people a lot of money who were trafficking her, basically. And Paul got upset one day and cast the devil out of her and she couldn't do what she did before for these people making them money. And so they got, went to the Roman authorities and made something up and said, these guys, you know, messed up our business and livelihood. And so Paul and Silas got stripped, whipped, chained, and restrained. I want to talk to you about government overreach this morning. If ever there was government overreach, oh my goodness. Like they prayed, cast the devil out, and they got stripped, whipped, chained, and restrained. And if you read the story, they tell the jailer, as we'll see, put them like, make sure these guys don't escape. They must have known the word was up that they could get out of prisons and stuff. But So he puts them in the inner prison, puts them in stocks. They're chained up. This is absolutely government overreach right now. Now, I'm going to skip verse 26, and I'm just going to give you a quick spoiler alert because I want to end with verse 26. But i got to talk about the, Paul and Silas' approach to massive government overreach because I think it's important. Um, but they praise and, and they get free. The, the, the earth, the, uh, everything shakes and the prison doors are open, the chains come off. So just so you know if the story, if you're not familiar with it, we're going to skip that part, but understand they're free. And we're going to jump into verse 27. And it says, the jailer woke up. So he's sleeping. They're all, it's middle of the night, midnight it says when they're praising, and he's snoring away. And obviously there's a loud noise that starts to happen. And he sort of wakes up and is like, what is happening here? And it says, he woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he thought the prisoners had escaped. Watch, this is important. So he pulled out his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted at the top of his voice, don't harm yourselves, we are all here. See, we usually read 25 and 26, jump up and down and get excited and then just kind of forget this. But any movie I've ever seen, any prisoner that I've ever known, when there's, a, when there's something that happens and someone gets in and for some situation all the prison doors get opened, how many of them just stay in their cells and go, I'm just going to stay here? Not in any movie I've seen. There's riot, there's anarchy, there's overthrow. There's like, we're free, we're not supposed to be locked up here, and everyone tries to escape. But it says here that Paul yells, don't harm yourself, we are all here. See, Paul and Silas, in that moment when the miracle happened, they had their freedom. They were free to go. And you know what? They had their right to go. They were wrongfully accused, wrongfully imprisoned. They had wrongful government authority over their life at that point. So they had every right to get out of there and say, hey, see you later. I'm out of here. Why didn't they? Because they would have understood probably in hearing or knowing the culture, that if they left that prison, if those prisoners would have escaped, that jailer's life was nothing. It was dust. He would have been killed. And as we see, he says he was about to kill himself when he thought all the prisoners escaped. He was like, yeah, I, did, I failed in my duty. And so Paul and Silas didn't do that. Their approach demonstrated something we cannot miss in all of what is going on and all of COVID and government restrictions. And that is this point we cannot miss that Paul and Silas are showing us here is that Paul and Silas's freedom did not trump their compassion. Come on, think about that. They had every right and every reason and the ability to run and say, hey, let's get out of there. But their freedom in that moment, because they understood if we leave, this jailer's life is over, it did not trump their compassion for the jailer. That's profound. And in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul comes back to it and talks about this when he says, I'm allowed to do anything. I have the right to do anything. Paul and Silas had the right to leave, but he says this, not everything is good for you. 
Not everything will be helpful or beneficial. And he talks about your neighbors. Watch, watch, watch this, watch this. So, verse 25, they're singing and praising. Verse 26, which we'll get to. And we're, we're going to be done in a few minutes here. So just stick with me for another few minutes because this is important. But see, we get excited about the miracle. Oh, the chains were broken, and the things shook, and everything quaked, and we're like, man, God really moved. But you guess what? It says here, according to this, it was not the miracle that actually ministered to the jailer. See, it says when the jailer came open and saw the miracle before, his reaction is, I'm going to kill myself. But verse 29, it says, The jailer called for a light, rushed in, and fell trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas. Then he, then he led them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, it wasn't the moving and shaking of the prison doors that captured this man's heart. It wasn't the miraculous power as he walked out that said, Hey man, I, I'm going to choose something. In fact, it made him want to kill himself. What switched him in an instant is even though they had their freedom, even though they had their rights and could have escaped, they chose because of him and their compassion to stay in it and it was their compassion plus their freedom that equaled his salvation who oh. oh. come on do you guys got five more minutes I need some more water I need to have a break there we go Come on, come on. I'm going to, I'll like sweep it towards you. That was terrible there, babe. It's beside you or Aylan there. <laughs> I didn't want to hit someone's head. There we go. All right, back to the middle. A few more minutes. Who's ready to praise? Who's, who's, who's ready to put God in a prominent place in this inner city? in the lives of you and what you're going through? Who's ready to put God there and watch some weights lift? Who's ready to let God inhabit their praises today that starts to change this place? I am. Okay, verse 25 again. At, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and other prisoners were listening to them. I often wonder for me what would be coming out of my mouth in this situation. Or I often wonder what would be coming out of 2020's mouth in this situation. Would I be complaining about my freedoms being taken away? Would I be saying it isn't right? Would I be protesting the fact I was stripped, whipped, chained, and restrained? Would I be protesting against, against, against? I talked a few weeks ago, but maybe we could define ourselves on what we're for instead of what we're against. We could be known for that. See, we don't know what real, like, if this happened, but if you read this account, not one objection to what happened came out of Paul and Silas' mouth, except at the end, when they say, finally say, Paul and Silas did not leave that prison until the authorities came and said, hey, you guys can go, go in peace, and Paul and Silas said, no, 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 you brought us in with big fanfare, you're going to let us out with big fanfare. That was their only protest. But in this story, you don't hear them once say, hey, we should not be in here. Now, they may have, but it wasn't important enough to be recorded, and so they just understood that. And I think if Acts 16, 25 were written today, it would say this, about midnight, people in 2020 were protesting and complaining to God while everyone on social media were listening to them. Complaining, protesting, and I'm not just talking about like, Protest. I'm talking protesting with being against something and protesting something and doing that. See, it, it's just protest, protest, I'm against this. And as Shakespeare wrote, uh, me lady, you doth, me doth think you protest too much, me thinks, or something like that. You doth protest too much, me thinks. See, I think this. Ready? Me thinks this. If we were willing to praise half as much as we protested, I believe God would move twice as much as we expected. I I'm going to say that again. If we praised half as much as we protested, I believe God can move twice as much as we expected. Do you think Paul and Silas's protests would have broken them out of that prison? Jailer, we're not supposed to be in here. This is not what we're supposed to do. Protest. No, 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 that's not what opened it. It was their praise. 
I've heard people say, I can't, or I won't praise with the mask. I won't praise if we have to be spaced. I can't praise. And I notice that I feel it sometimes. Not today, actually. But you kind of just feel it, and there's that heaviness on our praise because it's uncomfortable. But, but I need to say this. You, know, uh, you may think the only way to push back government overreaches and fear and infringement on our freedoms is to protest. Uh, uh, but we think fear is winning. I said this on Friday because we're wearing masks when we're distanced, when we're isolated, when church numbers are supposed to be 30. No, fear doesn't win when this is happening, fear wins when well this is happening, we use it as a reason to not praise. Oh, that got quiet, so maybe I went too far, I don't know. So let me put you at ease here. See, because I'm not saying that the chains are right. They weren't in Paul and Silas's case. I'm not saying, music team, come on up. I'm not saying that the infringement on our freedoms is right or wrong. I'm not saying the, the, the shutting down churches is right. I'm not saying that masks are right. I'm not saying restrictions are the correct way to proceed how they've done them. I'm not saying that we should never protest. What I'm saying is that in the middle of the chains, in the middle of, of our freedoms being infringed on, in the middle of restrictions, in the middle of churches being shut down, in the middle of being stripped, whipped, chained, and restrained, we still must find ways to have a break and praise. Yeah, you, I think you said it. I just couldn't tell through the mask. Come on. Come on. In the middle of this, we must still find ways to say it's break time. I just need to pull away, and I need to get me myself like David, and I need to start lifting some, some of my voice, and I need to start clapping, and I need to start shouting, and I need to, come on, music. Come on, music. Give me some synth chords or something. Woo! Okay, all right, because watch, 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 and we're going to get into some praising here. I went too long, but it's wild to get it out. See, not one thing has been said that keeps us from dancing. Come on, not one thing. Not one thing has been said to keep us from clapping. Come on, let me hear you clap today. Not one thing has been said to keep us from tapping. Maybe tapping, you know, that's a stretch for you today. Come on, then you can tap. See, not one thing has been said to keep us from laughing. <laughs> and despite this heaviness, despite this weight, despite what we see and how it doesn't seem to be coming to an end, I still got the ability to laugh. I still got the joy of the Lord inside of me. There's still something to laugh and rejoice about and praise about and sing about and dance about and clap about. See, not one thing has been said to keep us from shouting. Well, they've tried, but as long as we're distance and max, we, mass, we can do it. Hallelujah! And not one thing has been said to keep us from praising. Come on, stand. Come on, let's stand. Come on, in upper room, stand. Wherever you're watching, let's stand, because I believe some things are going to break. See, things may mask our faces, but they're not going to mask our praises. Things may try to mask our spaces, but they can't mask our praises. Things may try to mask our places, our homes, our church, but they will not mask our praises. Verse 26, suddenly, everyone say suddenly. suddenly. With like a suddenly. suddenly. There was a violent earthquake which shook the prison to its foundations. At once all the doors opened and the chains fell off the prisoners. Point three and we're done. When we begin, begin to praise, everything else starts to fade. And I added this because I, as I was doing it this morning, when we begin to praise, everything starts to change. So the things that have been dominating your minds and your thoughts and the struggle, it starts to fade as we give a prominent place to God and He inhabits these praises. And then they start to change, change as chains are broken. Oh. 